good afternoon, aloha, uh, aloha, or maybe good evening and also good morning. And thank you very much for taking the time to attend this session. My name is Naoko Okimoto, an Evan Legacy Successor certified by the city of Hiroshima. I'm not an Evan survivor, uh, but I'm telling the story based on what I learned from an Evan survivor exposed to the effect of the atomic bombing in Hiroshima. Each survivor or hibakusha has a unique experience of encountering the atomic bombing. So what I will talk about today is not a whole picture of the atomic bombing, but an example of a Hiroshima survivor among many others. Many survivors have never spoken about their experiences, but there are also survivors who have passionately shared their experiences. However, many are now aging, so the city of Hiroshima started training younger volunteers to carry on their memories as Evan legacy successors. The story I am sharing with you today is that of Mr. Mutsuhiko Segoshi, who was exposed to the Tommy bombing in Hiroshima when he was in the fifth grade. He was over 80 years old when he shared his experience of World War II and the air bombing with us. First, I will talk about his experience before the bombing and then have a short question and answer session. And then resume his experiences on the day and after the atomic bombing. By the way, except for the first two pictures showing Mr. Segoshi. All other pictures are not his own, but show Hiroshima at the time he was there. And I also added several drawings on it. Mr. Mutsuhiko Segoshi, or Mutsu, was born in Shibuya, Tokyo in 1934. In December 1941, when he was in first grade, Japan started a war against the U.S. and the U.K. Japan also attacked other Asian countries soon after attacking the Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. In 1944, the Japanese government decided to let citizens who are not able to participate in air defense activities, including elementary school children, evacuate to their relatives' homes in the countryside to mitigate the effect of the air raids. Mutsu was in the fourth grade at that time and had a grandmother in Hiroshima. So it was decided that Mutsu, together with his mom, who was pregnant, and three-year-old three brother, would evacuate to their grandma's house. However, his dad needed to stay in Tokyo to work. In July 1944, around 8 p.m., that came to Tokyo Station to send off his family. When the train departed, his dad said, Mutsuhiko, I'm counting on you. Please take care of your mom. And he clapped his son's hand. Mutsu talked like a Tokyo boy, which sounded strange to children in Hiroshima. They laughed at him every day, saying, you talk funny. They bullied Mutsu, sometimes even hitting him after school. This violence was overlooked at school to a certain degree to train strong soldiers. The most terrible problem was the lack of food. They were hungry every day. The Japanese government controlled supply and distribution of food and commodity. Aside from money, People needed to show their passbooks or pass tickets to get a set amount of certain items at a set period. Rice distributions were often delayed and often even skipped. Their rice container was always empty. As alternatives, they ate pumpkins and potatoes, as well as the dumplings, which were made from the byproduct of soy oil production and a paste-like mix of flour that still had the inedible wheat husks are removed and the brown left over after making flour. They wouldn't put these dumplings into a soup. Uh, they would put these dumplings into a soup with spinach-like greens. This dumpling soup never made their stomachs full. Everyone was hungry. 
from infants to adult. They felt powerless, but tried hard to sustain themselves, chanting, we will never want anything until we win. At school lunch was provided from Monday to Friday. Mutsu always looked forward to lunchtime. But lunch was usually just potatoes or pumpkin with a few grains of rice. So the children would say, hey, I have 10 grains of rice here. I have 20 grains. Due to the lack of food, nearly the entire school yard was cultivated to grow sweet potatoes. From the last few months of 1944, all the major cities in Japan were subject to terrible air raids by dozens or hundreds of bombers. But Hiroshima suffered nothing but a few individual bombs. Mutsu was targeted twice by American machine gun fire. The first time, a fighter plane suddenly appeared over a pine tree near his house. It fired a machine gun, da 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 and the bullet hit the ground just three feet away. He could smell the gunpowder smoke. He ran and jumped into a concrete container where feces and urine were being held for use as organic fertilizers. Although it was a life or death experience, he never felt he was gonna die. He didn't actually see anyone hit by a bullet. The second time was a few days after the Atami bombing. Because his mother's head was severely injured, Mutsu was washing his baby brother's diaper in the river near the dugout they had evacuated to. Mother shouted, run! Suddenly, a fighter plane started firing a machine gun. Bye, 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 bye. Since the fighter flew low to shoot, he could clearly see the face of the pilot. Again, Gunpowder smoke rose nearby as the fighter flew away. In April 1945, when Mutsu entered fifth grade, elementary school children in Hiroshima were also encouraged to evacuate to a relative's house in the country. Those who had no relatives in the country joined group evacuations led by teachers. Late in June 1945, the teacher in charge of Mutsu's class visited his house to persuade his family to make him join a group evacuation. The teacher talked to his mother for a long time. Until that time, Mutsu had refused to leave his family, saying, I'll never go there. I'd rather die with my mother and brothers. That night, mother said, according to the teacher, this will be the last chance to evacuate. He said, you will be able to eat plenty of rice there, enough to get full. Mutsu was reluctant to join the group evacuation, but seeing his mother caught between the teacher's will and his own, he couldn't keep refusing to go. In early July, the morning Mutsu was to leave for evacuation arrived. His mother roasted some barley and soybeans, put them in a can, wrapped the can in wax tape to keep it dry, and put it in his bag. Mother said to Mutsu, eat them little by little when you feel starved. At that time, a can was very precious. All metal materials in homes had been turned into the Japanese government to manufacture weapons for the war. After receiving canned milk as a ration for mothers with babies, his mother had carefully kept the can. Hundreds of pupils gathered and lined up in their school groups in the plaza in front of Hiroshima Station. There to send the children off were mothers, grandfathers, and grandmothers. Most fathers had been drafted into the military, so they were not at home. Family members had been told to send their children off at a nearby crossing, not on the platform, as some children might insist on staying with their family if they were sent off from the platform. As the train left the station, children moved to the seats on the right side, shouting, Mommy! and crying. 
they search for their family members among the crowds, waving for the crossing. In the late afternoon, the group from Mutsub School arrived at the station, the border between Hiroshima and Shimane prefectures. Six graders who had been living there since April that year welcomed them. They stayed in a village community hall, and this spacious hall was divided by plywood board, with five or six children sleeping together in each space. They were tired from the long trip, so they slept immediately. After a while, Mutsu woke up with someone kicking his head or pillow. He heard a low voice from the bedside saying, Bring your bags and sit side by side in the corridor. Even the sixth graders who had welcomed them earlier that day. The newly arrived children were told to hold their backs and kneel down with their bodies supported by their heels. The sixth graders ordered, take everything out of your back. They took everything edible, things like small dried sardines, dried sweet potatoes, roasted corn or beans, and whatever anyone had. The newly arrived children resisted, begging the sixth graders not to take their food. A third grader was crying and saying, Don't take my food! Mother told me to treasure it and eat it little by little. My father died in the war. But the sixth graders took it all. Then it was Mutsu's turn. He didn't want to give them his precious can of roasted barley and beans, so he resisted, holding the back tightly. The Japanese pot candle uses bamboo swords made of four sticks tied together. The sixth graders turned one of these swords into a set of bamboo canes. They whipped his back, slap, slap. No, I'll never take it out, I won't. After hitting his back several times, the bamboo can hit Mutsu's neck, and the can came out of the back, rolling onto the floor. Oh, you have something nice, the sixth grader said, and continued hitting Mutsu with the bamboo can. All of a sudden, Mutsu's mother's face appeared in his mind. She was shouting, that's enough, let it go, just let it go. Mutsu suddenly lost his strength and thought, Mother, I'm sorry. Mutsu didn't sleep that night. The sun came up the next morning. The children had breakfast in the dining hall, which has a spacious Japanese-style room in the elementary school next to the community hall where they were staying. Included in the breakfast were a small label bowl of plain rice, which he had never seen for a long time, some greens and a couple of miso foods. There were elementary school children from eight to 12 years old. Naturally, they had good appetites. They ate very quickly, but couldn't ask for more. Although his mother had heard they would be able to eat their fill, that never happened. They were still always hungry. Every night, sixth grade that hit Mutu with the canes made from the bamboo sword. They insisted that Mutu apologize to them for not being, being obedient when they, took their, when they took his food. They tied Mutu's wrist behind his back, pulled him down to the floor, and whipped him. He couldn't resist. He thought that he had no, no reason to apologize. He hadn't done anything wrong. He never screamed, never begged them for forgiveness, and never apologized. That made the sixth graders hit him even more violently. He happened to notice that the one leading the hitting used to be a very caring boy who served as president of the student council before the group evacuation. Under the severe circumstances of the war, 
disrespected older child began hitting weaker children and seized the food their parents had prepared. The war demonized even the minds of children. After a few days, a teacher saw Mutsu in the corridor and asked, Are you all right? Do you feel sick? Mutsu didn't meet the real cause of the pain. He explained that he couldn't sleep at night due to the pain from a chronic illness. The teacher said, I'm on a Hiroshima business trip tomorrow. Let's go together. You can go home and see a doctor. You can come back here after you get well. Thus, Mutsu went home to Hiroshima about a week before the atomic bombing. So this is Mutsu's experience before the bombing. Do you have any questions? Is it okay so far? Um, yes, we actually have a question from Abram and I will call on him. Um, oh, okay. <clears throat> Abram, I'm going to unmute your microphone. Go ahead and ask your question for Naoku. Um, <clears throat> Hi, Ms. Nayuku. I would like to say that you are a very skilled drawer. My name is Abram, and I am very glad to be here. I currently live in Nevada, but I was born in Tachikawa and lived there for four years. Mm -hmm. My question for you is, when did you realize that you had such a passion to study history? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, actually, uh, I, I have many, uh, how can I say, uh, yeah, re reason to to st start uh, start history of Hiroshima. Uh, first of all, I was raised in Hiroshima, and uh, uh, I'm not a, not a relatives of uh, Evan Evan survivor. Uh, but uh, when I was an elementary school uh, child, uh, my mother uh, interviewed some Evan survivors and and told me uh, what kind of story she had heard. Uh, and also, uh, I married, married to the second generation of Hibakusha, uh, so my parents-in-law uh, were exposed to the atomic bombing um, when they were, uh, I mean, my father-in-law was five years old and uh, my mother-in-law was two years old. So uh, that, yeah, that's from my personal aspect. And also, I had the opportunity to work at the Hiroshima Peace Culture Foundation. So all, all those things uh, made me study history of Hiroshima. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Jaden, and I'm, I'm getting a number of questions uh, in the chat. So if you want to just maybe if we answer four or five questions, and then um, do you want to uh, go into... Um, back into your story, what would you prefer? Uh, okay. Uh, 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 I'd like to answer maybe one more question. Whatever you are comfortable with. So give me a second and I will unmute uh, those participants. So uh, Jaden, you are uh, unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, hi. It's really fun talking, uh, having you talk to us, even though with the current situation, it's really fun that we can still learn about world events that made history. And my question was, were the sixth graders instructed to steal their food when they arrived or did they just do it to survive? Uh, so, so, sorry, maybe, maybe I, I didn't hear your question, but could, could, you, could you repeat it? Jaden, yeah, you can go ahead and repeat it, friend. Um, my question was, were the sixth graders instructed to steal their food or did they have to do it to survive? Ah, good question. I think, yeah, they also need to survive uh, because uh, as uh, shown in the, the story, uh, yeah, they were always hungry. So, uh, but still, yeah, yeah, I think they, yeah, they, they needed to do it for survive, but uh, uh, yeah, the point is before before the evacuation, uh, they are not like that. So something really changed them. So um, we have a question from Malia, and Malia, it's it's great to have you back. I recognize you from our, our one of our previous events. Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead and ask your question. You have a really great question for uh, Naoku. 
Um, hi, Miss no uh, Nayoko. Um, my name is Malia. Uh, where did you um, did you learn to draw yourself, or did you go to college uh, to learn it? Uh, so about the drawing. Yes. Where did you learn uh, how to draw? She was uh, asking. Uh, 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 well, I, I didn't go to art, art college or anything. Uh, but but I I belong to uh, art club since uh, elementary to college for ten years. That so uh, drawing is one of my hobbies. All right. And with that, if we can, uh, we'll jump back into the story. And you said you wanted to save for more questions. Guys, if you have more questions for Naoku, go ahead and type them in the chat feature and we'll call on you towards the end. Okay. So, shall I continue? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So now I'll talk about on the day and after the Tommy bombing. In the morning of August 6, 1945, the midsummer sun was blazing from a clear sky. Mutsu lived in a town called Kanomachi, located in western Hiroshima, surrounded by farms and fields. At the northern edge of the field, five wooden, one-story connected houses stood in a line. Mutsu and his family lived in the middle of the five houses. Around seven in the morning, Mutsu's family heard the yellow alert siren warning that, that an enemy plane was approaching. They hid in an air raid shelter dug into the ground behind their house. The shelter, which they had managed to make without any of the loud males in their family, with some neighbor's help, was just a hole 10 feet wide in diameter with galvanized roofing on top that was covered with soil. When the air raid alert was lifted, Mutsu went home and was talking with a girl who lived next door neighbor in front of their house. Chibo, his four-year-old brother, was listening as he sat on the windowsill. Mother called, Mutsuhiko, breakfast, Mutsu replied, okay, and went in the house. Chibo kept talking with the girl. Mutsu sat beside a low round dining table facing his mother. He reached out to receive a bowl of sweet potato or maybe dumpling. At that instant, he saw a sudden, strong, white flash. Pika! Then he heard a rolling. Go! The blast blew up and dropped the floor, made the house's support lilin fell down, and blew the roof tiles down. Mutsu had no idea what was going on, but clearly remembered the scene. After the flash, a few seconds before he heard a whoa, his mother's face turned pale like a, like a wax figure. She screamed and jumped in quickly like a bird to throw herself over her six-month-old baby in the next room. Broken roof tiles and other debris fell from the roof and hit mother's back that debris damaged her spine, leaving her with a serious back injury. One and a quarter miles from the hypocenter and unshielded, the terrace houses were almost completely flattened and destroyed. Out of the debris, covered with dust and dirt, mother stood up with her baby and called, Mutsuhiko! Mutsu also stood up saying, monsters, damn them. Chibo's voice came in from the windowsill shouting, Mutsu! He had been knocked down by the blast, but was shielded from direct exposure to the heat by a straw mat hanging outside the window to dry. He didn't get burned. Everyone in the family had blood on them, but they all survived. However, the whole body of the young girl from next door was completely burned. Mutsu learned later that she passed away three days after the bombing. Mutsuhiko, get the emergency kit and let's get out of here. Mother led the family out toward a small dugout in the field behind the house. On the way, they encountered a horrible scene. 
a young woman from the house behind the Segosis, who used to take good care of Mutsu and helped him study, was being supported by her grandfather. She was crying. Where are we? Where are we? A large piece of wood was stuck into her forehead. The wood was hanging down and her head was spewing blood. At the dog out, mother said, let me carry Kunibo on my back. She passed Mutsu the baby she was holding. Mother's spine was damaged. Her whole back was covered with blood. Mutsu thought it must be painful for her. He put the cloth on to protect her back, then put Kunibo on it. To Mutsu, Kunibo looked like a lamp or black pole, but he was still breathing. Mother, Kunibo is alive, Mutsu said. His mother put Kunibo on her back without saying a word. Her right thumb was almost cut off, just hanging from her hand. He put some ointment on her thumb, attached it, and rubbed it with bandages. Mutsu's left knee was injured. The wound was torn open and kept bleeding. Chibo was bleeding from his right knee and ankle. His wounds were treated with absorbent cotton and tied with clothes. Before the bombing, the sky was completely clear. But suddenly, it started pouring large drops of heavy rain. Mutsu wiped the rain from his arm and found out black and muddy. He had no idea about the horrible radioactive materials contained in those black raindrops. In front of the house next to them, the girl Mutsu and Chibo were chatting with just a short while ago was lying on the ground. Her mother couldn't move either. She crouched down beside her, holding her big tummy with her hands and crying. Ooh, ooh. Her baby was due soon. Mutsu said, Auntie, hang on and wait for uncle. He will be home soon. Looking back later, Mutsu thought he had said something irresponsible. It was not at all sure that her husband would come home. Mutsu's family decided to cross the river and, to go, and go to an acquaintance's house west of the city. When they reached the river, the bridge was burning. It was a furious fire. They certainly couldn't cross the river. Meanwhile, Mutsu was seeing horrible scenes from hell. Victims came from the east with severely burnt skin, terrible injuries, mourning. Water, water. They put their heads into ditches and stopped moving. There are crowds of people lying on the riverside. He couldn't even tell if they were male or female. They were so terribly burned. Their hair was burned. Their skin hung from their arms. Their bodies were hideously burnt and blistered, exposing wet flesh. Mutsu bent down and just stared at some of those people. He saw a small child uh, protected under its badly burnt mother's dead body. Then Mutsu heard a man's voice, hell, this is hell. He looked back and saw a man with no clothes. His body was charged to an indescribable brown or blackish color. He approached. Mutsu said, Mister, where did you come from? He replied. Takanobashi, where 0 0.9 miles from ground zero, and he sat down shivering. A young soldier who seemed to be a teenager rode a small boat towards them. He shouted as he commanded them, injured women and children first. Despite the chaotic situation, 
No one rushed the boat or pushed their way in. They just lined up and waited their turn. The Segosi family waited for five or six trips and finally got a ride to the west side of the river. The Segosi family all continued to walk despite their injuries. When they arrived at their acquaintance's house, they heard the voice of someone in pain. Ooh, it hurts, it's hot. The eldest son of the family, who was in the eighth grade, had returned with his body severely burned. He had been exposed to the air bomb while working outside. He and his classmates were mobilized to demolish houses to make fire breaks in case of a fire bombing. The whole family was in a panic. The Segoshi family couldn't ask for their help given that situation. A small unattended Shinto shrine stood just up the hill from the acquaintance's house. The Segoshi family decided to stay there for the night. When mother put Kunibo down, he cried weakly. He's still alive! Mother was weeping. Mother took some crackers from the emergency bag. Mutsu ladled some water. The family shared the crackers and water. Mother began breastfeeding Kunibo and smiled down at him. A few days later, they decided to go home. Since their house was in ruins, for around two weeks, Mutsu slept in the dugout in the field. His mother and mother slept on the lower shelf of a closet that was still standing at the north edge of the destroyed house. It was completely dark at night, without electricity or radio. So Mutsu and his family went to sleep around 6 p.m. and woke up around 4 a.m. Toward the end of August, it became cooler at night. Mutsu woke up early in the morning, around 4 a.m. as usual. All the birds uh, bird had died, so no sound could be heard. Nothing could be seen in the completely dark and silent surroundings. Mutsu went to the hand pump, hand hand pump in the field, washed Kunibo's diapers, and hung them up to dry. After that, his hands were cold. He was warming them over a bonfire where he thought he heard the sound of something approaching from a distance. Crunch, crunch, crunch. It was getting closer. Mutsu took up a piece of burning firewood and stood ready to fight. A dark figure stopped 16 to 20 feet in front of him. Mutsuhiko. You are Mutsuhiko, right? It was his father's voice. He had missed his father, who had been away for a year. He remembers that time at Tokyo Station, where he shook his hand and said, Please take care of your mom. Mother woke up, but seemed unable to understand what was going on. Then they talked through their tears. Dad said, I'm so sorry. I couldn't come home sooner. It took a long time to finish my work. I couldn't find a way to contact you, but everything gonna be all right now. The next thing they knew, the dawn had come and it was growing light. Dad said he had arrived at Hiroshima station around 10 p.m. Everything was burned to the ground. Hardly any buildings were left as landmarks but he kept walking all night through the scorched field from the northeastern edge to the southwestern edge of Hiroshima. Finally, he arrived at the ruin of their house. Mutsu thought a guardian angel must have guided his dad home. I have just told you the urban experience I had from Mutsuhiko Segoshi. He has also spoken about the after effects of radiation. He said he suffered from urban disease, 
Shortly after the air bombing, his hair fell out just from pulling it. He often felt listless and couldn't participate in physical education classes or sports days until he was in junior high school. After the bombing, his parents have never talked about it. He too wanted to avoid these memories. However, around 2012, he heard the Evan testimony of a physically handicapped female survivor over 90 years old and decided he should also convey the painful memories he had never talked about. He wanted young people to know. His experiences show how Japanese society was covered with culture of violence during World War II. You might remember that his classmates bullied him because he spoke like he was from Tokyo. Some sixth graders took precious food from young, younger children and hit mutu with canes made from a bamboo sword. During World War II, it was taken for granted all over Japan that people could be bullied just because they were different. They could be detained or treated violently. Similarly, Japanese soldiers treated people badly in other countries in Asia. Meanwhile, US troops shot indiscriminately from fighter planes, including children, completely banned cities with incendiary bombs. Then the atomic, used the atomic bombs to devastate whole cities with a single bomb. I'm not blaming any specific country, but I'm blaming the war. When war breaks out, the precious life of each individual is not respected. People are harmed and even killed easily without even a feeling of guilt. In war, given the extreme violence, whole societies are transformed, becoming structures of violence. Violence becomes common practice, forcing people to obey. War and peace are generated from human minds. The first step toward a peaceful world is to build peace in our minds. We have to respect the differences, talk to people, make friends, and treat the people around us well throughout our daily lives. We cannot allow bullying or any form of violence. I'm also thankful for many American citizens who supported people in Hiroshima after World War II with food, medicines, housing, and other types of donations. Their behaviors have changed perception of Hiroshima people towards Americans. We are friends now. In the past, Japan started a war and attacked your place, Hawaii. The war harmed and divided people who had peacefully lived together. However, we should never repeat that mistake. The inscription on the cenotaph for the atomic bomb victims reads, let all the souls here rest in peace, for we shall not repeat the evil. Let's think about what we can do to avoid repeating the evil of war and certainly nuclear war. Let's do what we can do to build and maintain a peaceful world. This concludes my talk on behalf of Mutsuhiko Segoshi. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Naoku. We appreciate you so much. And I'm going to unmute everyone at the very end so we can give you a, a nice, polite round of applause. But as you can imagine, if I were to unmute over 100 people, it might sound a little chaotic right now. Uh, would it be OK if the uh, guests asked you some questions? Yes. OK, so we have Ignacio is uh, going to go first. and. Ignacio, give me a minute. I'm going to uh, unmute you here, pal. Uh, Ignacio, you are unmuted, and Ignacio has two questions. Go ahead and ask your questions. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. My first question is, why were, prior to the bombing, why were only children evacuated, and what happened to those who stay? And my second question is, how long did it take for Hiroshima to be harbored have it all again. Um, uh, so, sorry, could you repeat Can, the first question? Yeah, ask the first question. That was hard to understand. Why were, prior to the bombing, 
Why were only children evacuated and what happened to those who stay in Hiroshima? Um, I thought, sorry, maybe. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat. I, I got you, Ignacio. I wrote, I wrote both, down both questions, pal. So uh, Ignacio's first question was, uh, why were only children evacuated before the bombs? And what happened to those who stayed in Hiroshima? Ah, OK, th thank you, thank you. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, yes, so, so Japanese government decided uh, so those who cannot participate in air defense drills to go uh, to evacuate. So it means uh, older people, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, junior high school students need to work at factories uh, or uh, doing uh, demolition of houses like the, the eldest son of the, the acquaintance's house. Uh, so they needed to work to help their uh, air defense activities. Uh, and also uh, many doctors were prohibited to evacuate. That's why Hiroshima lost 90% of the doctors after the bombing. And, wow. and so, so only uh, children who were third grade and to sixth grade, uh, uh, grade, uh, grade, grade three to grade six are allowed to evacuate to the countryside. Of course, smaller children need to be with their mom, I think. Wow. Uh, and his second question was, how long did it take for Hiroshima to become habitable or livable again? Uh, well, um, at that time, people are not so familiar with the effects of the radiation. So some people actually continue to live, uh, live and, but uh, of course it's harmful to the, their health. Uh, and uh, uh, regarding the, the plants, uh, the next spring, uh, so the, the uh, plants are uh, blooming or or show the green leaves again. So uh, despite uh, it, is, it was said that uh, Hiroshima wouldn't grow anything in, for 75 years, that didn't happen. So after one year or so, so plants are, uh, plants are growing. And, and, uh, and also in September, there was a, a big typhoon and uh, a, after that, uh, pe people are also living there. So, so actually, uh, yes, people continue to live uh, because they are not so familiar with the effect of the atomic bombing. Uh, and uh, uh, so now, now, all, uh -huh. now those who entered Hiroshima uh, within two weeks uh, after the bombing in our uh, officially recog recognized as Hibakusha. Mm, wow, very interesting. Uh, we have a question from Abram. Uh, our friend Abram, you are unmuted. Um, hi, my, it's Abram Santos again. Uh, my question for you is, if you could compare Japan in 1944 and in 2020, what similarities could you explain about it? Oh, similarity, good question. Ah, similarity. Ah, so, sorry, I, I cannot come up with um, any similarity at this moment. Uh, uh, because uh, after World War II, uh, I believe a Japanese society has changed because we, uh, we pledge never to repeat the war again. Uh, so the society is quite different, I think. Um, wow. So, so, sorry, I, I cannot really... No, you're fine. Uh, that, that's totally fine. And that's, that's interesting. And that should be a true testament to just how, uh, how much um, this, this situation uh, changed your culture and, and the history of Japan. Uh, we have a question from Jada. Jada, you are unmuted. 
Hi, so I was wondering, how did the bomb affect the people that were farther away that didn't, like, die? Like, how, what was the effect on them? So uh, Jada wants to know, how did the bomb affect the people that were far away from the epicenter? The ones uh, that did not die. Uh, okay. Uh, so basically, uh, those who are within uh, really one mile, maybe uh, most of them are died. But uh, uh, for example, if they are something like uh, one, one point eight miles from the hypocenter, uh, they still got burnt uh, if the skin was not covered by clothing. And, and further, uh, even 10 kilometers, uh, well, how many miles away? Uh, six, is it six miles away? Eight, That's 6.4 uh, uh, 6. Uh, 6. Uh, yeah, yeah, miles, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, from the hypocenter, uh, if the black vein drops, uh, it affected people's health. And actually, uh, in Mutsu's family's case, uh, his, so his case, uh, he is uh, from 1.24 miles uh, away from the hypocenter. So their family didn't, uh, was not were not killed. Uh, how, however, uh, they de developed uh, so-called Ebon disease. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for that answer. Um, we have a question from Maria. Maria, uh, you are, um, un I'm not sure if you're muted yet. Uh, I might have to ask her question uh, for her. Um, while we wait uh, for me to find that question uh, for Maria. I'm going to go ahead and call on Jaden. Uh, Jaden, you are unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question. Well, it was really a great presentation and it's very an in interesting subject to know about. And my question was, what do you want my generation to remember about the bombing of Hiroshima? Okay, he wants to know, what do you want, what do you want the next generation to know about when it comes to the bombing of Hiroshima? Oh, th thank you. Uh, actually, uh, so like you, I, I don't have any experience of uh, atomic bombing, uh, but uh, uh, still we have a lot of nuclear weapons. Uh, so it is important to know uh, what will happen if uh, any atomic bomb or nuclear weapons will be used. So, so I hope you can also uh, yeah, work together to, to abolish nuclear weapons, hopefully. And the final question uh, comes from Maria. Maria, she wanted to know how many people survived the bomb? Oh, how many people survived? Well, uh, at, at the time of the bombing, uh, it is estimated that uh, around 350,000 people were, were in Hiroshima. Uh, and uh, uh, in the case of atomic bomb, people continue to die due to the effects of radiation. So they, at the end of uh, 1945, it, it has been estimated that 140,000 people uh, have died. However, uh, but it's still difficult, difficult to calculate uh, because, for example, uh, you might know the story of Sadako Sasaki. She, she developed leukemia 10 years later. So we, we don't know if we can say she had survived or maybe she died because of the atomic bomb. And, uh, the father of my mother-in-law uh, died two years after the bombing. So, so my mother-in-law's father was not counted that 140,000 people who, have, who had died by the end of 1945. So it's really difficult to say how many people had survived. Um, we have one... Um... We have one final question, and I'm going to go ahead and unmute uh, Scott. Go ahead and ask your question. 
<laughs> oh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you. Uh, you had mentioned the people in Hiroshima were supported by people from the United States after the bomb. Were these uh, Japanese immigrants or uh, other Americans? Could you explain that a little bit more, please? I, I yes. I, so uh, it's not necessarily uh, Japanese immigrants. Uh, for example, the, the one who, uh, who helped in housing is Mr. Schumer uh, and uh, Shuno, uh, and uh, uh, also so a lot of foundations uh, helped, uh, helped Japanese people. They are really Americans. And even, I know even are uh, an American who was detained uh, in, in Manila uh, donated Hiroshima after the war. Uh, please visit our website and uh, thank you very much Naoko and uh, Amy, Jen and Chris. So we will continue working together. So please wait for future events. Thank you.